First of all, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for the event, Can We Have More Green Roofs? as part of the event series in New York Open Data Week 2022. Uh, my name is Wei. I am currently a um, second year dual Master of Science in Urban Planning and a Master of Architecture student at Columbia GSAP. I will now hand it over to my partner, Fang. Hi, everyone. My name is Fang. Uh, I'm currently a graduate student in the Advanced Architecture Design Program at Columbia GSAP. Um, so we are very excited today to present our research project titled, Can We Have More Green Roofs? on how urban data can be utilized to cope with environmental issues and propose strategic responses for the city. In today's section, we will walk you guys through the project proposal and um, urban data mani manipulation process, uh, which will be further subdivided into five main sections and appendix section for um, your reference information. So to begin with, we want to elaborate on why we choose urban heat island effects as the main subject of our study, particularly what it means for urban metropolis like the city of New York. First of all, what is urban heat island? So according to the definition from United States Environmental Protection Agencies, heat islands are referring to those urbanized areas that experience higher temperatures than outlying areas for metropolises like New York City, along with rapid urbanization in recent years. The urban spaces have long been affected by the heat island phenomenon. While it is also noticeable that formation is, uh, of this phenomenon is dynamic and complex, often hard to conceptualize due to the heterogeneous nature of all factors. But however, Urban data provides a lens to examine the issue, which is our project is about. So there are many negative impacts of urban heat island phenomenon to our city. The Environmental Protection Agency has listed three main categories of these impacts. First, urban heat island will increase energy consumption. Here is one easiest example. Um, during the summer in urban centers where urban heat island effect is severe, temperatures are usually higher than outlying areas, which means that to maintain the same level of human comfort, the, uh, the urban centers will consume more energy for all for air conditioning and ventilation. The increasing of energy consumption will cause more carbon emissions and potential air pollution to that area. The third impact more directly related to humans themselves is that urban heat island effects will compromise human health and comfort. So, um, here are some facts about urban heat island. Mostly they contribute to the formation of such phenomenon in an urban context. Artificial structures such as roads, um, buildings, and other infrastructures absorb and re-emit much more heat radiating from the sun than water bodies, forests, and other natural landscapes, which correlated to their specific heat capacity. One inherent physical attribute of the matter. So natural coverings, uh, including water, vegetation, have much higher heat capacity than metal or concrete materials. Um, in other words, the temperature of one unit's ground surface covered by artificial materials will dramatically increase more than those surfaces shielded by natural landscapes when absorbing same amount of heat. As a result, uh, urban areas where those low heat capacity materials uh, from manufactured structures are highly concentrated, uh, become the islands with higher temperature than the surrounding suburban areas with larger natural surfaces. Therefore, a well-developed -de metropolis like the New York City will experience much dramatic heat island effects due to the highly densified urban constructions and insufficient open green spaces. As a response, um, our aim is to take the opportunity that urban data gives about the built environment, try to understand the nature of the heat island phenomenon across New York City and its further implication to the built environment. Through this project, we aim to investigate areas in the city that can be utilized to mediate such an environmental crisis. So for our investigation, we specifically looked into great infrastructures as means of fighting against urban heat island effects. 
Green infrastructure refers to infrastructure system that are constructed for solving urban and climatic challenges by building with nature. The main component of this approach include storm water management, climate adaptation, the, re the reduction of heat stress, increasing biodiversity, food production, better air quality, sustainable energy production, clean water, and health soils, as well as more anthropocentric functions, such as increased quality of um, the uh, life, the recreation, and the provision of shade and shelter in the surrounding towns and cities. Green infrastructure also serves to provide an ecological framework for social, economic, and environmental health for surroundings. Therefore, it is an effective and practical approach that we can apply to reduce the temperature and improve, and improve the environmental resilience in urban areas. Among all green infrastructure techniques, green roof is particularly feasible for green infrastructure construction in urban metropolis like New York City. It is a smart choice for limited spaces. There are about 730 buildings with green roofs in New York City, which merely represents 60 acres of the total 40,000 acres of rooftop spaces available. In other words, um, less than 1.1% of New York's 1 million buildings is currently green roof spaces. This evidence indicates a great possibility for adding more green roofs across the city. It can benefit not only temperature detection, but also food production, storm water mediation, air pollution, energy saving, urban species diversity, and even job and, ed and educational opportunities. Therefore, under the framework that the previous research has constructed, our research question is, where are the city-owned, currently empty roof spaces that we can convert to green roofs to elevate the heat island effect across the New York City? So how do we decide where to put them? And what are the criteria? For the presentation today and the project itself, we first define a scope and a methodology that the project implies, which mainly consists of five steps. Pattern in identification and borrow section, and then facts, layer identification, and then multi-criteria decision analysis, case sections, and case analysis. To elaborate, the scheme of our process begins from identifying the pattern of the heat island effect across the city of New York, then investigating how it corresponds to the built environment and what the city has done to mediate this impact towards our living environment. The investigation further inform us what we can do to uh, more to elevate its influence from areas that can be identified and extracted. In our case, to present three building roofs that can be converted to green roofs in the selected borough based on a multi-criteria weighted calculation. By examining the research outcome through GIS analysis, our hypothesis is that the city government can add additional green roofs to the building in the selected borough where the heat island effect is more severe while a lack of green infrastructure, infrastructure is presented. So for this section, we will move in with more details about our research methodology and how urban data is collected and incorporated into the decision-making process. We would like to begin this section by methodology overview for this project, which primarily uses multi-criteria decision analysis for the final decision-making. Uh, multi-criteria decision analysis, in short MCDA, is a process that transforms and combines geographical data and value judgments to obtain information for decision-making, which is currently a very crucial method for the planning discipline um, that implies nowadays. The multi-criteria decision analysis is made possible by mapping algebra, which describes cells in terms of values through the form of equations. So um, I'll just take the example, um, the diagram on the right as example, the final ranking suitability map grading from zero to three is a combination of values of each decision layers at the cell level. In other words, under the same framework or with the equation, each cell's values is calculated individually and represented as a field of a collection of final scores. So um, as it indicated in the land surface temperature visualization with USGS Earth Explorer data 
measure from August 26 to September 1, 2021, the urban surface temperature vary widely in New York City, ranging from 59.7 to 110.5 Fahrenheit, suggesting a significant pattern of urban heat island effects across the city. Among all five boroughs, Queens experienced the most drastic urban heat island effects among all boroughs in the among all the rest of the boroughs in the city, with an LSD ranging from 59.7 to 106.4 Fahrenheit. Um, so therefore, Queens is selected as the um, target borough for further investigation. In addition, to maintain the granul granula granularity and the specificity of this project analysis, the raster cell size of a 30 by 30 feet is made as to the baseline units for all the other layers. So based on the thermal comfort temperature criteria, the full range between 59 of 59.7 to 110.5 Fahrenheit was subdivided into five categories and reclassified with the value range of one to five. Since the land surface temperature is the most crucial factor in generating urban heat uh, island effect, this layer is weighted by three for the final decision layer. Um, as indicated in the int introduction section, um, land cover type contributes significantly to the formation of urban heat islands, specifically those materials with low heat capacity. The original data set from the study of the Department of Environmental Protection citywide parcel-based improvised area found on the New York Open Data Platform had detailed 18 material types that together form New York City's built environment. Based on the uh, scholars Jiang Chengzhao and Extra, uh, their research assessing thermal uh, contributions from different urban land cover types. Our projects divided the 18 identified land cover materials into five different categories with water as the baseline. All classes of land cover type were reassigned with new classified scores ranging from zero to 10, valuing their thermal contributions to the heat island effects. Due to the importance of land cover type, this reclassified layer is weighted by two for the final decision layer. So to avoid the redundancy in the construction of green infrastructure and to identify areas lacking their presence, the existing green infrastructure across the borough were mapped, including existing green roofs and other types of infra infrastructure such as rain gardens. The related urban data is found on the New York Open Data Platform provided by the Department of Environmental Protection and on the nodo provided by researchers. A kernel density map was constructed using a surge distance of one mile for the visualization, then reclassified with a score range of zero to five. It is important to point out that um, the highest score refers to the areas that lack of green infrastructures, while the lowest score means that the site doesn't need uh, pretty doesn't need much additional infrastructures. In other words, the need to add green roofs in negatively is negatively correlated to the density of existing infrastructures. Um, this layer is weighted by two for the final decision layer. And finally, as a direct uh, indicator of the level of urbanization, the number of floors reflects the extent to which a city expands vertically. Our proposal identify areas with a high urbanization rate as potentially lacking enough open spaces for environmental interventions. Therefore, the number of floors across the city was categorized based on a common standard for um, development, one to three floor as low rise, three to five floor as low to mid rise, five to eight as mid rise, eight to 11 floors as high rise, and above 11 floor as, uh, uh, as skyscrapers. Correspondingly, the score range of zero to five was assigned to this layer and weighted by one for the final decision map. 
um, the building floor information uh, you can find um, on the New York Open Data Platform's Map Pluto shapefile. So as a conclude with each layer's thermal contribution to the urban heat island effect determined, the final decision layer was calculated based on the formula. So uh, three times final decision, uh, the, the final decision layer equals to three times reclassified Queensland surface temperature plus two times of uh, reclassified Queensland land, land cover type plus two times of uh, needs for green infra infrastructure layer and plus one times of level of urbanization layer. So um, I also just saw one of the questions that um, Pravin um, had posted in the chat um, asking about the data uh, sources for our project, uh, which is sort of listed here on the upper lower corner of the slide. Um, but we will go more into details of like uh, which um, platform exactly um, are those um, data sources from when we go to the appendix section um, later on. Um, and to um, the new question um, by Shali, sorry for the mispronunciation, uh, was the reclass reclassified score calculated by you? Um, if so, how do you determine the weight weightage? Um, so I guess as what we've been sort of introduced in uh, the previous section, um, there are uh, four characteristics that are corresponding to the generation of urban heat island effects across the city and the importance, or in other words, the, uh, the weightage of each layer is determined by uh, the extent to which um, each character will influence the um, urban heat island effect. So first of all, very obviously, uh, um, temperature itself is a very important factor in determining the extent of the urban heat island effect across the city. Uh, so that's the reason why we've been sort of weighted them the most um, in time by three for uh, the first layer. And then the second, which is the main sort of contribu uh, contributor to um, the generation of heat across the city is the surface material. Um, as the first section um, have sort of introduced the brief uh, introduction of different material types and their contribution in terms of heat capacity for the generation of um, heat island effect um, is severe in determining um, um, such factors in uh, the entire process. So that's the reason why we weighted this by two. And um, to avoid the redundancy for the green infrastructure, uh, we've taken the existing green infrastructure across the city into consideration. Um, so that's weighted by two as well for um, to not put uh, redundant green infrastructures at the same location or to say the locations that um, currently don't need that much green infrastructure compared to the others. And the last one is the level of urbanization, which is a reflection of the, um, I guess, the, uh, the extent of urban uh, urbanization across the city um, also um, could potentially influence the um, urban, urban heat island effect. So that's the reason why we're also taking that into consideration um, while only with it one, because we think materiality is more important to consider um, then, um, yeah. the form of and also form. before we uh, start to giving the weighted, uh, you know, give them like different uh, weight score to each of these layers is because we have uh, uh, done some researchers, uh, researchers before um, this, all this uh, uh, jobs that we did through uh, the GIS platform. So we kind of figure out that uh, the uh, land surface cover is much more, um, have much more uh, significant impact to the general uh, formation of the heat island effects. Yes, so um, yeah, so that's, I, I hope that answers the question. And to um, um, Parvin's question, could you post a link to the presentation? Uh, yes, we um, will do that um, very soon. Um, yeah, after the open data week, thank you for um, helping us. Um, yes, so we will have the slides available for um, the review later. All right, so um, going into the case collection, among all existing but not utilized property routes in, uh, in Queens, New York, which is a selected borough, three were selected for green roof sites to mediate the heat island effect across the region. 
Um, as described in the previous section, the final selection was made based on a weighted decision map that uh, um, evaluates the site's four identified characteristics that contribute to the urban heat island generation, uh, with a score ranging from um, 7 to 49 as the final score for all available roof spaces. So the higher the score is, the more suitable the site is for the green roof proposal. Um, and after that, our research has sort of strategically chosen three sites with different public programs. Uh, so the first is Long Island City High School. The second is Q7A Sanitation Garage. And lastly, MTA New York City Transit, um, Transit in Queens, um, aiming to bring back the awareness of the environmental concerns and to further educate people about the possibility of green infrastructure that can be employed throughout the city. So for the first case, um, Long Island City High School in City Council District 22, it is ranked among the top choices with a score of 44, uh, with a building footprint of 61,500 square feet. Um, the school is located in an area with the highest temperature score and lead cover due to the high concentration of materials contributing to the urban heat island effect, while significantly lacking green infrastructure. Uh, in addition, we think that the green roof addition to a school will contribute to the educational purpose of this program. Thus, um, this building is a strong candidate to um, add a green roof. And Q7A Sanitation Garage in City Council District 19 also ranks among the top choices with a score of 44.5. With a building footprint of um, 85,000 square feet, the garage is located in an area with um, the highest temperature score and the cover score due to the high concentration of materials contributing to thermal change, while also significantly lacking green infrastructure similar to that of um, Long Island City High School. In addition, as a sanitation garage, uh, the green roof addition will also bring awareness of, environment, of environmental concerns for the citizens. Thus, this is also a strong candidate for uh, green roof addition. And lastly, the MTA New York City Transit, um, which is located in Queensboro in City Council District 27. It also ranks among the top choices with a score of 45.7. Uh, with a building footprint of 190,000 square feet, it is located in an area with similar meteorological and topographical parameters to the first two. Um, in addition, as a kind of public transition infrastructure, uh, transportation infrastructure, the green roof addition will also bring awareness of environmental concerns for the citizens. Uh, I guess one thing to mention here is if you look at the scores, um, the three sites that we selected are not those that are like the highest in terms of the score itself. So they are not like 48, uh, 48 or 49, but we structurally chosen the sites because of their first of all program, but also their feasibility for the conversion of green roofs. So um, we also have some like conclusions uh, based on all the researchers we did. And uh, there are also some ref reflections of what's the limits of the, the projects. Um, so through, uh, throughout this project, our team like, had completed the research questions um, and identified three available and appropriate roofs in Queens owned by the city government that can be converted to green roofs to mediate the urban heat alley effects. Well, those are only three among the you know, 2,491 available spaces for intervention. This project had laid out a methodology to, an to analyze and value those roofs for continuing works. The three identified roofs are starting points for the city to consider existing opportunities in the built environment to fight against the environmental crisis. Therefore, it can be or should be taken as a long-term program for the city government to create a more sustainable future for citizens. However, we have also identified constraints that, that this project embodied based on the assumption that all roofs can be evaluated under this framework. This research project is based on the, the assumption that the identified roof is suitable for green roof conversion. However, the, uh, the practic prac practicality of green roof construction depends on each building's existing structure type 
and load bearing capacity, which is hard to identify from a data oriented perspective, but should be done through further on site investigation. Mm. The practicality of green roof establishment remains unclear with pure data interpretation. So the city government should work closely with construction companies and other agencies to further determine each roof's appropriateness, considering its exist existing structure and low bearing capacity for the addition of green roofs through a pragmatic uh, pro programmatic lens. Yes, and um, I saw the in the group chat that um, again, sorry for the mispronunciation if I did it wrong. Uh, Matt Haven um, has said that the government is pretty active on the topic, and we do agree that uh, as um, a uh, like a lot of city agencies has been participated into creating sustainable futures for um, the city and building green infrastructures, and we think that. Uh, what this project um, can do is to provide a uh, another lens to examine um, the possibilities of more um, green opportunities for the city through a data point of view. And we hope that um, this will be helpful and um, for uh, the city, uh, I guess, as a way of thinking about um, how we can examine the built environment. And um, jo Jody, um, if you Hi. Uh, this is really great and really very timely. Um, I'm thinking about other applications for it. The mm -hmm. city just passed the unified stormwater rule, which requires new buildings to do a variety of mitigations. And using your analysis, I could see them requiring the green roof as the first mitigation in certain buildings in specific areas that meet your criteria. So um, this is very interesting work and um, quite an impressive piece of work. So congratulations and, and thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. We we're also yeah. very excited um, that this project came out and um, as a way of for us to advance our understanding of the built environment through data perspective and to sort of um, keep working on this theme of sustainable development. Um, of That's the city. That's great. I did have a question. I noticed that you put 11 to 104 floors into yeah. one category, and I was curious why you didn't lump smaller buildings together, because there is a big difference, as you mentioned, for the thermal exchange for bigger buildings, yeah. and some of the areas have been highly developed. They've suddenly had this big increase in many floor buildings in lower density neighborhoods. Yes, um, thank uh, um, you. I think this is a, a very valuable question. Great. Yeah, I'll go, go take this question. So for 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 this, uh, how we reclassify it, first of all, is that uh, after we actually did the, the, the temperature, uh, the map uh, for, for the entire city, we're trying to figure out which uh, area has the, the most, have, have been, you know, like suffered, uh, the most uh, from the heat island effects. We, 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 at the beginning, we assume it should be, you know, the center of Manhattan. We feel that that should be the area, but then like we, we find out it's not the truth. So that, that's the reason, also another reason why we identify that the urbanization layer as a, you know, the, the layer has the, the, the least uh, uh, weighted, weighted score for all the compared to all the other layers. So um, for um, you, you can go ahead for to explain the oh, yeah, sorry. Sure. Yeah, the floor <laughs> how we did it. Yeah, so for the classification, uh, I guess to directly answer your question of why we um, choose to group 11 to 104 as one category is partially due to the fact that uh, the Queensboro uh, comparing to Manhattan does not have that much um, skyscrapers. Uh, when we look at the map Pluto data for information, uh, most of the uh, buildings in um, Queens are kind of clustered in the first, I guess, five categories. Um, so we decided to dive deeper into, the, um, I guess, the well, comparing to uh, Manhattan, a relatively lower range of building heights, but um, trying to give it more of granularity and detail into um, the site selection specifically for Queens. So I think if this methodology 
uh, will be redue for the uh, Manhattan um, borough, I guess the classification will be different because of um, the urbanization um, level in that specific. Yeah, just before uh, you actually apply this method to actually analyze a certain area, probably need to do some like pre-work first, like analysis the typology of the building types uh, at the beginning. And then later on, you can reclassify uh, based on different criteria. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. That makes sense. And thank you for the question. Um, thank you. Clarify the um, project as well. And to answer um, Danielle, your question, um, have we considered publishing the full list of potential sites as open data? Um, yes, um, we currently have all the um, available roof spaces in Queens as a kind of a data layer that is already um, kind of finalized. Um, however, uh, that kind of speaks to one of the limitations that uh, Long just mentioned is the feasibility or I would say the practicality of green roof conversion. Um, a lot of the um, roof um, spaces, uh, while we look at the a kind of uh, two-dimensional satellite image, it seems um, feasible for a green roof conversion. However, when you look into Google Street View or um, to just look at the building itself, uh, we are currently still not sure about the structure, which um, whether or not it will support the system. Um, so I guess we still need more work on this data set, but I think this is a great, really great idea to have um, this data sets available for the general public um, once we have that uh, uh, produced. Um, and to Matt Hava's question, are you folks also part of the SDSN Trends in Columbia University? Um, this is actually a new piece of, of information for us. Um, so we will- um, But we're definitely gonna check it out because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we will. Um, we are um, currently belonging to the architecture program, but I think uh, the university's resources can um, also be a part of our um, project as well. So thank you for brought it up. We will look into yeah. um, this um, later. later. Once we yeah, <laughs> and I was like, going to be a great chance for us to exchange, you know, the information and we can do more, um, maybe uh, do more like a thorough, a much more thorough studies with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Do you folks um, interact with any city agents? You know, part of. Uh, <laughs> I'm just curious. Did you mention environmental protection and EPA? I was just curious. Uh, at that point, when we do, because it this is just all like you know purely data oriented. As we said, like the limitations. We definitely, if you really trying to actually you know eject or or maybe you know like uh, launch this project into real life, maybe we, we I think we're definitely gonna do that. You know, corporations with the city agencies, but. For at that point, we 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 didn't do that. Okay. Yeah, so this yeah. project is developed as part of a geographical information system course that we um, had in the urban planning program at GSEP. Um, so this is uh, a relatively short uh, period of um, time for the project, but I think at this point, um, after also um, getting into or participating in Open Data Week and have the possibility of engaging with city agencies, we think. Um, we really wanted to push this again um, to make more engagement with the city agencies that can make this um, plan happen. No, definitely, you know, definitely a partnership. And I think a lot of these policy making decisions that go into, obviously, you know, this is very important for New York City and I guess, you know, <laughs> New York State and in fact, all world, but, uh, you know, in terms of having this kind of, uh, analytics available at the same time using that as to implement policy and or even projects among city that, that we all thank you so much thank you. Um, yeah and to um daniel's point about uh, some building characteristic attributes and 3d resources that could eventually be integrated into the project yes correct um i think one uh if we will be pushing the if, um, on the way to push this project to the next stage. Uh, another maybe layer of data that we can add is the building attributes um, to look at the building data or the structure data to see if it is really 
um, it can be incorporated into a scheme for the consideration of green roof conversion. So thank you for bringing that up, and um, that's a really valuable point uh, for our project. And um, yeah, thank you, uh, Matt Havan and Daniel, for uh, your appreciation for the project. Thank you. Um, and I guess uh, kind of continuing with the reflections, one thing that Fawn already uh, sort of mentioned is the conventional understanding of environmental patterns across the city, uh, because um, as you know, as our conventional, our uh, first thought about um, this project is that Manhattan will be the targeted borough for the intervention. However, it turns out that Queens is the borough that experienced the kind of most drastic temperature range uh, in the summertime uh, across all five boroughs. So that's really um, kind of knocking on the door for us to you know, be cautious about applying conventional or like common sense while doing a research project. Um, and lastly, I think one of the challenges that we face uh, during the first stage of the project development is um, the lack of data availability, specifically for temperature data in the New York City. Um, so the New York Open Data platform does currently um, does not have a data set that provides surface temperatures um, that is granularly enough for us to um, work with analysis. So we utilize another open data sources from the USGS um, uh, Earth Explorer website to uh, proceed with our analysis. And I guess for the uh, last um, section, we will um, use the spaces for this methodology diagram and data sources that we've been utilized throughout the project. Um, so this diagram um, seems a little small, but also looks very complicated, but this um, kind of diagrams are a process of the entire project. Uh, which starts from the raw data set that we found on different types of um, data, form, uh, data platform, mostly New York Open Data, uh, which is kind of framed in yellow. And through um, kind of geographical data processing and manipulation, uh, we've got through those reclassified and uh, reworked layers marked in, uh, framed in the green um, kind of framework as a way of proceeding with the multi-decision criteria analysis um, layer which have um, eventually led to the selection of available roof spaces and um, the case selection that we um, just presented. And lastly, different types of um, data sources that we use for the project um, that has been utilized. For, so for the first one, the USGS Explorer is the one where we got the land surface temperature, uh, where we actually went through uh, another round of GIS processing to convert an image um, to um, um, geographical information about uh, the temperature in the city. And uh, the current, the, um, sorry, the following couple um, data sources were utilized for uh, the um, uh, land cover type and green infrastructures in the city, which is, which is provided by the Department of Environmental Protection and um, uh, the Department of City Planning um, that we can get from the open data platform in New York. And um, lastly, the literature references that um, we've been I'm referring to to support our argument um, in the project. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, so it's our great pleasure to present our work with you guys. And we would like to take this opportunity to thank you. Um, thank Professor Leah and Daniel, as well as our teaching assistant for their help along the way. We're now open to questions for more questions for from the audience and would love to maybe showcase some details, steps on the jazz uh, workstation if you're interested. Thank you. Um, uh, I think there is one more question from, um, uh, I guess oh, I it's a suggestion uh, from Jody mm -hmm. to, uh, also show change over time, much like the park de department did uh, with tree canopy. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think the, the land sets, the temperature data we chose for analysis, for our analysis is uh, most recent years. Um, uh, we can definitely do some like comparisons, you know, like as to actually just to um, help people more clear about the ideas of how the uh, natural landscape gonna influence uh, 
the uh, you know the formation of key ally effects and how like probably there are already been precedents happen uh, throughout the city that uh, you know like large park or green inf infrastructure has been constructed and then uh, uh, significantly uh, you know reduce the the heat island effect already. So we can use as as a part of the references of our analysis for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And I was thinking with the uh, upzoning of specific neighborhoods, um, how that we we could use what you've done to show a difference between before the big buildings came in and what their effect was on on the heat effect. So it's very exciting. It's very interesting. Yeah, thank you so right. much. Thank you. I agree with you, Jody. Uh, just, just uh, I was just curious in terms of uh, um, is part of this research where existing green infrastructure were already included in terms of like mm -hmm. you know rain gardens lately it's been a uh, yeah. Right. Um, I can probably share um, the kind of raw data sources that we um, got and then process from the New York Open Data Platform. Um, that's kind of like that are utilized to uh, visualize where the existing group infrastructures are. So I will um, stop share the PowerPoint and I will um, maybe just share a little bit about the GIS workstation. I hope you guys are still seeing the screen. Um, so this is basically um, on the left is the GIS workstation on the right is the uh, methodology, detail methodology that we implied uh, throughout the process for um, the multi criteria analysis. Um, so there are available infrastructures um, in the city. So um, if you look at the layers, um, there are green infrastructure points that we've identified. So the green dots are uh, where the uh, green infrastructures are located. As you can see, I'll turn off some of the layers. Oops, I think I accidentally. Uh, it's a, yeah. yeah. So um, as you can see, a lot of the um, parts of the city already uh, imply a lot of infrastructures, while um, there are um, neighborhoods definitely um, can have more uh, green infrastructures as indicated just from visually looking at this um, dotted map, uh, which consists of not just um, green roofs, but also green gardens, um, bio spots that are uh, along the streets, um, all those type of infrastructures that are in the city. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone <laughs> has more <laughs> words as or any suggestions is uh, also welcome really to hear about. <laughs> well, this is very exciting. Yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, if you if you share the the presentation and even methodology, yeah, it's too great to you know see. Um, and I definitely I think there is a promise to have this knowledge base to actually. Uh, work with city agencies to apply these principles and probably opportunity. Thank you. Um, Jody, parks, community gardens, street trees are also a layer in open data. Um, GI usually is about, infrastructure usually is about storm water diver diversion. Um, yes, correct. Um, a lot of the data that we found, um, the main purpose for them is for the storm water um, management or mediation in the city, as um, you have suggested. Um, and um, the green infrastructure, the function of the green infrastructure and their benefits to the city, um, there are really many benefits, like um, the storm water management, as you mentioned, uh, but also others like pro providing recreation spaces for the residents and citizens. Um, and reducing and reducing um, temperature in the city um, as a lot of, you know, uh, even the, a lot of the lead project has been suggesting. And um, uh, like many other benefits, uh, so I think this is a really uh, great point that um, those are existing currently in the city and um, they have very positive impacts to the built environment of our time. Um, and to Manhattan, Manhattan, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> and correlations with, with energy consumption. Uh, that's, I think, one of maybe uh, one of the missing layer in this uh, work, which is to consider the energy consumption um, correlating to the urban heat island effect pattern, because as um, the Environmental Protection Agency has suggested, one of the uh, 
I guess, negative impacts of urban heat island effect is the increasing of energy consumption. So if we can find um, data or information about energy uh, across the city, that can be used as a kind of side-by-side, -side, um, uh, I guess, a president or even um, an example that can further support our argument of having more infrastructure in the city. Um, uh, and Laura just mentioned the uh, the year of build. Yeah, uh, we definitely actually we uh, just dropped several you know data columns for the um, the map Pluto uh, data layer because it's so many uh, informations associated with it. Um, but I feel I, I we think it, this is should be a really good point great point to select you know further filter down the available you know buildings that are suitable for roof additions. Um, if we later on we we could like for um, for the, you know the least uh, the post data and the open data for the available roofs we will definitely uh, I think this is a uh, great point. Um. Mentioning solar at plus plus another new piece of information um, that was available for us to look into. Yeah. Um, thank you. All right. So I guess that's kind of yeah. um, the overarching um, uh, for today. Of, yeah, for today and the pro uh, the project. Um, um and we are following <laughs> up the other the informations and wrap up uh you know the data resources and uh, I our presentation together to send to uh, you guys later. Yeah, to make it available. Thank you guys. Yeah.